Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. <laughs> it's a great pleasure to see you all. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm Dan Weiss, the president and CEO of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and it is a great pleasure to welcome all of you here for women, our, this year's Women in the Critical Eye program. We are enormously proud to host this event each year, and we're thrilled to have you with us once again to celebrate women in our community and in the collection. The Met would undoubtedly not be the institution it is today, and indeed, the world would not be what it is or could be without significant contributions of women artists, curators, collectors, scholars, and philanthropists. We are honored to celebrate their legacy and cultivate future generations every year, as we do here. Tonight, we are delighted to welcome Musa Meyer, the president of the, of the Gustin Foundation and the daughter of the iconic American painter, Philip Gustin, and brilliant curator and steward of her father's legacy, which she is now bringing to the Met with a gift of her extensive personal collection of paintings and drawings. This transformative gift, pro this transformative promise gift of 96 paintings and 124 drawings represents the full arc of Gustin's career and will position the Met as the largest repository of works by the artist and the leading center for the study of, our, of his work for, and its lasting impact. We are honored to have this great responsibility and really grateful for this extraordinary gift. A selection of work from Musa Meyer's gift will be on view in a special installation titled Philip Gustin, What Kind of Man Am I? opening on May 27th. And we hope you will come back to the museum next month to see it. The display, which will focus on the artist's deeply philosophical approach to the nature of artistic identity and the aesthetic possibilities of painting, is organized by Kelly Baum, the Cynthia Hazen Polsky and Leon Polsky Curator of Contemporary Art in the Department of Modern and Contemporary Art, with Brinda Kumar, Associate Curator in the Department of Modern and Contemporary Art. Kelly will join Musa in conversation today. We are deeply grateful to Silwasu for sponsoring this year's Women in the Critical Eye uh, in a brand new partnership. This is year one of that partnership to support a variety of activities for which we're very grateful. The Met shares a commitment to art and culture with them, and we're very grateful for their support and thrilled that they're able to join us this afternoon. And of course, this program wouldn't be possible without the steadfast dedication of our trustee, Lulu Wong, and the members of the 2023 Women in the Critical Eye Committee, whose enthusiasm and support has allowed this initiative to thrive now for 18 years. Thank you, Lulu, for your ongoing leadership at the Met and to everyone in this room for allowing this important event to grow stronger every year. And it has become an extraordinary event. And it is now my pleasure to invite Lulu to come to the stage. Thank you. Good evening. I am just so happy to uh, welcome you all to our 18th annual Women in the Critical Eye at the Met. And uh, as Dan said, I'm Lulu Wong, trustee emerita, and so honored to be the founder of Women and the Critical Eye. It has been a real pleasure to see how this program has grown and evolved over the past 18 years. The goal starting of this program was really just to create a community of women to enjoy and learn about art together, inspired by women sharing with us, whether as collectors, curators, artists, or professionals, how art has become a central part of their lives, enriching it immeasurably. This community has grown year after year, starting at 35 the first year, and this year to almost 700 uh, and counting. Uh, it's, it's grown because we've all brought our friends, our colleagues, our sisters, our mothers, our daughters, and we've all found that this shared enthusiasm has made art even more meaningful part of our lives. As always, um, I'm proud to present a program that is free and accessible to all. And in um, order to do that, we must be so grateful for the, the generosity of those of you who've said, you're not charging us for this, but can we do something to 
keep it alive and keep it going. It's so important. And so we thank you for your generosity and your stewardship of the critical eye and the museum's programs. And this year, this little effort, which many people thought would never really make any money for the Met, we've already totaled $390,000. And who said women were not generous, huh? <laughs> we are so grateful for these contributions, which not only provide general support for the museum, but also very importantly, it supports the Met's keen interest to acquire and represent important women artists throughout history. Now, um, your gifts to the Met permitted the Met to acquire one of Wangechu Muto's majestic figures, which were the inaugural installation in the Met's historic, um, historic niches, which were filled in 2019. Uh, Wangechi has gone on since our in, uh, installing her to becoming an incredibly celebrated artist. There's a show right now of hers down at the New Museum, and it has been garnering uh, rave reviews. There was a show of hers in San Francisco. So she has become really a, a leading woman artist and we were so fortunate to have brought her in early. More recently, uh, funds raised by our Critical Eye community has helped the Met to acquire a very different kind of uh, art. This is a very rare and striking painting by Rachel Rausch, the most significant woman artist in the Dutch Republic in the 17th and 18th century, many hundreds of years before Wangechu. This painting, executed in 1692, represents a very rare dual portrait of the artist, and it's a collaboration between herself and a portraitist, Michelle Musser. Now, Roy uh, Rausch was a very early example of career women who managed to do it all despite considerable professional barriers to women. In the 17th century, Women artists were primarily restricted to uh, painting flowers. It was considered to be not as important as the portraiture that the men were encouraged to produce. Now, we can conjecture that Rausch was determined to have a good portrait of herself in which she herself had a hand. So hence the dual portrait. The dual portrait is such that she produced a very beautiful setting. It's a bit hard to see in this uh, Lighting, but when um, it is uh, brought to the galleries of the Met and probably a little light cleaning, you'll see more details. But she produces a beautiful setting of architecture and drapery. And she had her male partner paint her, memorable, but as you can see from her expression, it's a very determined look. She was determined to have this painting happen. It's going to be under her guidance, and she had it. Um, she was not only just a great painter, but she was a great mother. She raised a large family of, of children. And she was quite the exception that she enjoyed in her own lifetime great success and renown. Very often, artists, particularly women, don't get recognized so after their passing, but she was able to manage her career very well. So flash forward to today. We are finally seeing a broader, even worldwide, effort to highlight great women artists in museum collecting. However, despite these good intentions, women continue to remain an underrepresented uh, segment of the museum's collections. And we really have to thank all of you for your help in helping the Met to address this uh, loss to the art world and to bring great art by women into the Met. Speaking of women, I would like to join Dan in thanking Sawasu for partnering with the Critical Eye and sharing our deep commitment to women and art. You'll get to meet some of our representatives from Sawasu in the reception, and I hope you'll have a chance to come by and say hello. Now, Dan himself has been an exceptional partner to the Critical Eye ever since he arrived at the Met in 2017. He has helped us to welcome our community every year. He has befriended not only our members, but also some of our speakers. And some of them often ask about him years after they've been on the stage. At the end of June, Dan will be retiring from active role at the Met. 
and there is not one of us who will not miss him and his wisdom, his energy, intellect, and heart immensely. We hope his many interests and um, extraordinary connections will keep him close to the Met, to all the friends and other initiatives that he, he has begun for us at the Met. So I want to say this all a good day. Now, as always, I'm always deeply grateful to my fellow trustees and host committee members, especially our Wonder Women, um, who play such a critical role in making this effort, event a great success year after year. They not only support us financially, but they bring in their friends and word of mouth. And I know that it's something that everyone in this community does. And I think that really is the secret sauce, that we love this event enough that we want to bring in people who are close to us. And of course, I have to acknowledge all the women staff of the Met whose tremendous professional commitment contribute to the success of the Met every single day. In fact, um, I'd like to give a shout out to all the outstanding men and women who protect our art, who guide our visitors throughout the museum, and with their love of art and, and their deep interest and often education in art, they are often as knowledgeable about the art as many of our curatorial staff. So again, when you walk through the museum and you see the, the, young, the uh, men and women who are guarding the museum for us, they are also lovers of art and, and very uh, knowledgeable. Now, it is now my honor to introduce our panelists this evening, two extraordinary women who have made indelible contributions to the art world and to the Met. Musa Gustin Mayer is the president of the Gustin Foundation, and she established that in 2013. Since then, she and the foundation have been great friends and donors to the Met. And as Dan has mentioned, she has gifted her extensive personal collection of paintings and drawings by her late father, the celebrated Philip Gustin, um, to the Met. Also, as a curator and a writer in her own right, Musa has devoted much of her time to sharing her father's work and bringing it to the public and furthering his legacy. Musa will be in conversation with uh, Kelly Baum, our Cynthia Hazen Polsky and Leon Polsky, Curator of Contemporary Art at the Met. I'm so delighted to welcome Kelly back to uh, the I stage for her second time. She was our curator who conversed with Wangechi Mutu in her studio in 2020 when we were in the pandemic lockdown. And it was the first major online event held by the Met because of the pandemic. And we are so honored that we women at the, at the Critical Eye were the ones who actually launched the Met into the digital age. <laughs> that deserves it. <laughs> So now it is my great pleasure to welcome Kelly and Musa to the stage. Please welcome them. Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. I asked Kelly to do first thing, pour me a glass of water. Lulu, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Thank you for inviting me to join Musa on stage for this conversation. I'm delighted to be back, and I'm delighted to be here with her in particular. Um, this is such an illustrious program. It highlights excellent women who do excellent things in the world, um, and it's the perfect forum for you, Musa. So thank you for joining us. Um, in many ways, our exchange is the culmination of a collaboration that began a little over a year ago uh, when I first met you in Max Holine's office. I think it was January or February 2022. Um, we've grown closer since then. We have um, edited many a press release over tables, reviewed slides, 
we texted, um, we've shared phone calls um, and, and emails. Um, our partnership, and I hope I can call it a friendship um, at this point, it has been truly one of the most fulfilling aspects of my last year here at the Met. So and for me as well, Kelly. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I will, I will take it with me, um, means a lot. I um, have immense respect for you, your perseverance, your intellectual rigor, your advocacy and philanthropy, which we'll discuss towards the end of our conversation. Um, over the last four and a half decades, you have dedicated yourself to advancing the legacy of your father, the great artist, Philip Guston. Um, but you did not come to that role immediately, and it was not always um, an easy path either. So, as some of you might know in the audience, the third edition of your family memoir, Night Studio. Oh, excellent. That's right. I should advance. There we go. Langeche. Perfect. Um, the third edition of your family memoir, Night Studio, is going to be published next month. We will carry it in our bookstore, so come back and, and purchase a copy. Um, I thought that I would begin our conversation um, and frame our discussion overall by reading from a passage from uh, what you call the afterlife of this new edition. Um, you write, openings, the 10th chapter of Night Studio, began as a class assignment at Columbia's MFA writing program in 1986. Among the many memoirs read and analyzed that semester, our instructor, Joyce Johnson, included her own minor characters. I was less captivated by her youthful love affair with Jack Kerouac, which actually I would have loved to have heard about, um, than I was by the revelation that those merely in proximity to greatness could actually have stories of their own worth telling. Joyce posed a question to the class, how might we construct our own memoir? And I suspect that that question was posed especially to the women in the audience who had played minor character to many a, a male character in their lifetimes. And so I wonder if you could tell us about the origin story of that family memoir, how you came to write it, and what story you chose to tell. So for context, I was um, in, in the MFA program in writing. I was maybe 15 years older than the next oldest student in the class. Um, I was in my 40s at that time, actually. And um, I, ha I was working uh, on a uh, failed novel about the child of a famous art historian who was struggling to find her own identity. So <laughs> when Joyce asked us to write a chapter of a putative memoir um, for the class assignment, I wrote uh, about my experience um, as, as a child going to my father's openings and what a... Um, what a strange and mixed experience that was for me. And I wrote about his anxiety um, always when he brought his work to the public um, from the studio and how difficult that was. And so began um, what turned out to be um, a full memoir. And given uh, who my father was, I was able to... Um, find um, a publisher. Uh, on the left, you'll see the first edition, which was published by Knopf. So I like to say that my, um, my history of publication has sort of started at the top and gone vaguely downwards. The, <laughs> the image that you see of my father um, on both the first edition and the new edition on the right which is about to come out, was taken actually uh, when my father was taken to Edward Weston's studio at age 17. It's a really remarkable portrait. But when De Capo, which publishes um, uh, books that have been previously published, art books, 
published it, they didn't want to go to the trouble of securing permission. And so the middle uh, self-portrait that you see is, is from the 70s, actually. So that was the beginning of my, uh, I, my uh, exploration of my own experience growing up. I found Night Studio incredibly moving because in that, in that memoir, you, um, you spend a lot of time talking about your relationship with your father, how you found him, how you lost him, how you found him again. And it seemed in large part that you found him only after he passed away because of the nature of your relationship um, as you were growing up. Right. I was always um, aware of the need to not disturb his work in any way. My mother um, was as devoted an artist's wife as any artist could hope to have, um, male or female. She, may, she kept the world away when he was in his studio, she gave him everything that he needed. And as an obedient child, I understood that that was my uh, role too, not to, not to be demanding. Um, and so I was left um, throughout my father's life really always wanting more of him. This is a common experience with the children of great people. Um, that they, you share your parent with the world. And especially as a child, that's not really enough. So um, on the left, you see a portrait of my mother and me. It's called Young Mother. And, um, and wonderful photographs of me with both of my parents. Um, taken in St. Louis when my father was teaching in the Midwest. I studied side. violin. when, So the house um, you see in this picture is in the Maverick Colony in Woodstock, or should I say was, because it's long ago been torn down. But we live next door now to where that house was. And my parents would, um, we would go for part of the year uh, in Woodstock when the weather was warm enough and spend the winters in New York. And I studied violin for a number of years with a, a painter friend of my parents, and a wonderful artist named Rosemary Beck. So there I am practicing for my next lesson. And the other photograph jumping way forward in time is uh, my um, father and me when uh, uh, on the occasion of my second marriage to my husband, Tom, who's here tonight, um, in 1976. And as an art historian, I also have to add that you studied art history I did. in college as well. Yes. I did. That was the closest I could come, really. I tried um, my own hand and very much like my mother, I gave up. My mother had, um, well, I guess we'll get to that slide because <laughs> it's important to recognize that I was taking my cues from, I guess, my parents' relationship and the role that my mother played. And that's one of the things that was really important for me to write about in Night Studio was my um, questioning of my mother's choices, which were very much a part of a different generation. And, and uh, my first husband was an artist, and I tried to replicate my parents' relationship, not very successfully. I write about that, too. <laughs> well. Let me advance to the next slide here. So, yes, so you are the daughter of two extraordinary people, your mother, um, Musa McKim Gustin, and your father, Philip Gustin, born Philip Goldstein. Both of them were artists, both painters. Your mother was also a poet. And at different points in their, um, in their marriage, their creative lives overlapped. And so tell us a little bit about 
the people who, who raised you, um, their own origin stories, experiences that shaped them, and by extension, you. Um, on the left, you see my father at 10 years old, which is around the time that his father committed suicide in Los Angeles. They were, he was the youngest of seven, uh, an immigrant family um, that um, left years before, uh, well, around the time of his birth, actually, because um, he was born in Montreal that left what is present-day Ukraine near Odessa uh, as a result of the pogroms that happened in the first decade or so of the century. And the family settled uh, eventually in Los Angeles, and uh, that's where my father grew up. And first, um, one of the ways that his mother actually gave him a course in cartooning uh, um, after his father's suicide. And um, in a way, he drew himself to some sort of reconciliation with that and found what would be his passion for the rest of his life. Um, he was uh, almost completely self-taught, although he did meet my mother at a very uh, brief sojourn at Otis Art Institute in Los Angeles. My mother uh, came from Panama, where her father, uh, they lived in the Canal Zone, and her father worked for the Bureau of Indian Affairs and was, um, though I never knew him, Fred McKim was uh, very interested in, in anthropology and particularly the Kuna Indians, as they were then called, forgive me for for using that term. Um, and um, there my mother is in this photograph paddling a canoe with one of the Kuna women. Mm -hmm. She was probably pregnant with me when he painted this wonderful portrait. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll explain what the little uh, NFS yes. insignia <laughs> mean in a moment, but, but just note them mm -hmm. as you look. This is a, uh, in the center is a wonderful portrait of my mother uh, from the, around the time that they were married in the mid 30s mm -hmm. and a self portrait of him. Mm -hmm. So my mother, was active actually during the period that my father did mural commissions under the WPA. And this pair of beautiful murals, they're quite large. They're about six by 18 feet, each of them. They were commissioned by the Department of Forestry and are now uh, in New Hampshire um, at a government building, I think it's a court building in uh, Concord, New Hampshire. Um, and sh I love them because they really um, are so quint quintessentially male and female in their sensibilities, mm -hmm. you know, and their subjects. Mm -hmm. And towards the... Yes end of your father's life, they were collaborating very Right, he directly. was always, she, she started writing poetry in the 50s when they were in New York. She studied with Kenneth Koch, I think at the New School, mm -hmm. and started writing wonderful poems, which I had published posthumously in a little collection called Alone with the Moon, uh, the title of one of her poems. But my father, as he did with several other poets, illustrated a number of her poems, and this is one. Mm -hmm. Well, the question that is probably on a lot of people's minds concerns the extraordinary, incredible promise gift that you made the Met late last year, 220 paintings and drawings by your father. Um, they span every period of his career. And I was very interested to learn from you that this collection 
was very carefully curated and that more than one hand shaped it, um, the group of works that came to the Met. And so I wanted to make sure that we had some time to talk about um, those, those paintings and drawings and also your reasons for promising them to the Met when you did, your hopes, aspirations, and, um, and we'll start with this slide. So this is one, this painting is called The Studio from 1969. It's probably one of the best known uh, uh, works of his last figurative period. Um, and you'll notice on the back of the painting, in my father's hand are the letters NFS, which mean not for sale. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so all during my lifetime, I was aware that there were certain paintings that my father would not part with. And um, after his death, when my mother and I um, set about photographing and documenting all of the work, we found a number of works that were marked, uh, both paintings and drawings that were marked NFS, not for sale. And this became the basis as time went on. Now we're talking all the way back in 1980, so this is 43 years ago that this whole process uh, with my mother for the first 12 years before her death and then uh, with me afterwards, and also with the enormous help and collaboration of David and Renee McKee, who were my father's gallerists until 2015, and were um, loved by him and dedicated to him for all those years that they worked together. So there were always key works. I remember hearing this work must go to a museum, not to a private collector. This work really shouldn't be sold at all. Um, and I started thinking as years went by and work was being sold that it seemed important um, to keep a collection that represented the whole of his work. My father died right at the beginning of a major retrospective uh, that opened at the San Francisco Museum of Mar Modern Art three weeks before his death, actually. And um, so I, I certainly was aware of the entire scope of his work and the importance of being able to show it all together, which is happening again for, I guess it's the fourth time mm -hmm in 43 years. Um, and so more and more I thought about keeping the best works, holding the best works aside from each period, um, principally to lend to museums for exhibitions. But I also had in my mind that, well, I didn't know what it was that I was saving them for. But I tell you, as I turn, as I anticipated last year turning 80, which I did in January, I thought these works have to find a home where people will know them and love them. They cannot be split up. They are, um, I, I knew by then from all the sales that works often went, especially when sold privately, especially overseas where there aren't incentives for collectors to give museums, uh, works to museums uh, as uh, bequests, that um, I won't say works are lost, but in a way they are, to the public they are. So I started developing the idea of possibly approaching different museums um, with the idea of giving a large gift with stipulations about how the works would be seen and how frequently and how many. And it seemed a little unrealistic at first, but 
you know how sometimes things happen in life and it feels like they're meant to be? So I knew Max Holline from uh, an exhibition he had, um, his museum had done in Germany when he was there. And so I knew he was Augustine lover. So I thought, here's an opportunity. Why don't I just start at the top, you know? <laughs> And you, you had also heard about the Tang Ming. You knew that. Uh, yes, that yes, was that was the Ming. other part yes. of it. Not to go on for too long, but but I knew that um, I was familiar with the Met's collection of modern and contemporary art. I knew that it could be stronger, um, and I knew that a whole new renovation and wing was being planned. So that was sort of the second thing that disposed me toward the Met, and then. The, th the third thing was my father's love of art of the past, of all periods. Um, not only his contemporaries, but um, Renaissance painting, Italian Renaissance painting. Um, th this was his very first, um, I hesitate to say mature work, because he was only 17 when he finished this. He's in mother and child. Mm -hmm. So you can see that it draws from Picasso, de Curico, uh, certainly Renaissance traditions of, of Madonnas and children. Mm -hmm. So um, I was always aware of this. And when, um, when I graduated from high school, my parents took me on, uh, I guess you could say, what used to be called the Grand Tour. We spent a long summer in Italy and went around to look at all the painters that he loved, all the Pieros and um, all the Montaignas and so many of the Renaissance painters he adored. So I got very excited when I thought about the Met for that reason. Um, so that's a long, long mm -hmm. answer to a short question. Yes, Sorry. Well, no, no, it's um, it's important, and and I'm just showing you now um, a sampling, and you'll see more of these throughout the conversation of of works that form part of the promise gift. You get a sense of their variety, their diversity, um, in subject matter, style, size, and media. Yeah, this is mm -hmm. just um, a flavor of mm -hmm. them, really. Mm -hmm. But some very notable, uh, the best works of this period. I won't talk about them individually. Uh, and I don't think any of these are in the forthcoming display that the Met is going to have. So it's a real, really wide diversity of work. So over the last many years, you have become one of the foremost scholars on your father's work. Um, um, uh, you have great expertise. I've enjoyed our conversations about him and I've learned so much from them. Um, uh, you have organized exhibitions of his work. You have published catalogs on his work. And since we have you captive here on stage, I thought we would take advantage of that expertise and have you briefly, since we really don't have much time, and I want to make sure that we keep coming around to you and your life and um, your accomplishments, but I thought maybe you could walk us briefly through his career in phases. We're going to break it into phases. So we're jumping into phase one, which covers roughly 1930, when he was a young artist in LA, creative connections to Mexico up to the late 1940s as he is moving from the Midwest to, okay. to New York. You time it, okay, and I'll I know. do it quickly. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> this is a monumental mural in Morelia, Mexico. The wall was secured by, um, by uh, Orozco, the, Mex the great Mexican muralist for two young painters, my father and his friend, Ruben Kadish. And um, as you can see, maybe we're gonna look very briefly mm -hmm. at this, but, but if you look particularly at the upper right, you'll see there are figures uh, from the Inquisition, from the Klan, mm -hmm. there's Nazi insignia. It's called the struggle against terror. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And that subject matter was a key part of his work early in his career. And likewise, his commitment to depicting forms of injustice, violence, racism. Mm -hmm. This was, this preparatory drawing is a part of the gift. The Tondo is in the collection of the Philadelphia mm -hmm. Museum of Art and it depicts the bombing of Guernica. Mm -hmm. And here he is in the Queensbridge Housing Project working on a mural. Mm -hmm. That's and still extant. Mm -hmm. That's still extant, but mm -hmm. unfortunately it's been, he had his name taken off of it because oh. it was repainted oh, okay. badly. Mm -hmm. So Yes, okay. Well, rely then on the drawings and sketches. Yeah, the that preparatory drawing is mm -hmm. really wonderful. Right. And it and it it's in this collection because it um, it was generative for mm -hmm. the work that was to come next. Mm -hmm. And you see motifs even in this early work from the late 30s and early to mid 40s, motifs like the um, trash can lid that will return in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. Another drawing. another drawing from mm -hmm. uh, the collection. It's really a sketchbook mm -hmm. drawing, mm -hmm. but it has many important motifs that mm -hmm. appear later. Mm -hmm. um, and there are hooded figures in this one. There are hooded, on the fi there are hooded mm -hmm. figures here. He, uh, early in his, well, we'll get to that, yes, actually, to talk should, about the yeah. early clan experiences. This is from, uh, um, this is from the late 40s. Mm -hmm. the, uh, it's a Life magazine feature on him. Um, he destroyed the work that was pictured in the magazine. He was very dissatisfied with his work, in part because he felt at that time really incapable of responding to the horror of the mm -hmm. Holocaust, mm -hmm. which in St. Louis he saw through the pictures mm -hmm. that Joseph Pulitzer had brought mm -hmm. back from mm -hmm. the camps. Mm -hmm. And I believe in the same issue of Life magazine, there is a profile on the Klan. Yeah, uh, on so the resurgence of on, the Klan. On the resurgence of the Klan. Yeah. So we touched on this briefly a few minutes ago, um, but the, the Met is in many ways the, the ideal home for the promise gifts that you're making to us because of your father's longstanding investment in the history of art, his interest in the history of art, especially classical Renaissance and Baroque. And he also had a relationship in his lifetime with the museum. The Met collected um, and even exhibited his work when he was alive, um, and we own several excellent examples of his work really from the beginning to the end of his career. And so maybe you could tell us a little bit about what we're seeing on, on this slide. So the painting is called Pantheon. And the photograph, and, and it's, it's from the 1970s. The photograph is from 1960. And he is on the, what do they call this? The Plain of Constantine? Oh. Uh, in Rome. It, it's a picture of him in Rome, a city that he loved and mm -hmm. revisited um, during his life whenever mm -hmm. he felt the need for renewal. Mm -hmm. And these are some of the artists that he felt were his personal mm -hmm. pantheon. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the paintings that you'll be able to see in the installation that we're organizing for Gallery 830 here at the Met at the end of, end of May. It's an extraordinary painting. And then just one more. Right. So that's my mother in our kitchen. And on the kitchen wall are images. There was always the, the, the great Dürer Melancholia print mm -hmm. on the kitchen wall. It's still there now. Mm -hmm. And on the wall behind his drawing desk, there are also reproductions of Renaissance mm -hmm. paintings. Mm -hmm. And the drawing in the foreground there is actually a copy of the Mantegna figure mm -hmm. from, a, from a famous um, uh, fresco. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we're skipping forward in time to the middle part of Philip Guston's career from roughly the um, late 40s, early 50s up through the um, middle 1960s. And um, this is a period um, for which I, I'm not 
sure if it's a period for which he's best known, but this is a moment when he began to achieve real acclaim. Um, he knew Jackson Pollock uh, in LA. They went to the same high school. Eventually, your father became associated um, with the abstract expressionists. He was part of the New York school. And the um, 1950s mark his, his really serious engagement with abstraction. Yes. Uh, he came to abstraction after, I guess as a, re a result, he went through crises at different times mm -hmm. in his painting career where he felt like he had exhausted whatever he had been doing and it no longer served him. He often would then spend years drawing. And his, his uh, transition to abstraction very much had to do with the act of painting mm -hmm. and allowing himself, as the other so-called action painters did, to, uh, so to draw on sensibilities and his own unconscious process mm -hmm. and bring forth work out of that. Mm -hmm. uh, the Met owns these two beautiful mm -hmm. uh, works from the early 50s. Mm -hmm. um, we own nothing from this period, mm -hmm. actually, because at that time he exhibited at Sidney Janice, mm -hmm. and Janice would take all the work and give his artists a living wage mm -hmm. and then resell it. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, uh, it was a very critical time for him, and he was very recognized for this work. In fact, mm -hmm. the Guggenheim Museum gave him uh, an, an, a retrospective, his first, uh, in 1962, um, the painting in the foreground was in that. It's called Fable Two, mm -hmm. and it's part of the gift. Mm -hmm. And then one more. And one more. This was the last big show he had in 1966 at the Jewish Museum. Uh, critics by this time were disenchanted with his work because it was so dark, mm -hmm. but people who know what came next, um, mm -hmm. understand that these dark forms were coalescing into mm -hmm. figures, mm -hmm. some call them heads mm -hmm. or personages. Uh, the three is mm -hmm. the title of the painting mm -hmm. that's part of the gift in the foreground there. And you told me once that your understanding is that the three is an uh, indirect reference to your family you I like to think that. I like to think so. Well, that's a beautiful thought. We will it hang out to that thought then. So we're moving now into the last part of your father's career. And really, to cover this with any justice or thoroughness, we would need many hours. It would turn into a seminar instead of a, um, a conversation. Um, this period spanned roughly 1967 to 1980, the year of, of your father's death, and was one of the most prolific periods of his career. He was extremely productive, creative, inventive, but it was also a period that was beset by, by crisis, um, one crisis after another. And so, um, and one change, one evolution. You can see him speeding along. It was almost like he packed 10 careers into that last um, 13 years. So um, you'll have to <laughs> really. What get I, these, I, yeah. will, I will race through this. Okay. Uh, what preceded his being able to paint again, remember I said that he often drew his way through these difficult times mm -hmm. of transition in his work, here he is in Florida, having left my mother and being alone down there doing uh, these drawings that are really very simple lines. Um, he did hundreds of these over this time, trying to find a way forward. And uh, it was a very difficult time. And simultaneously, Yep, so he is um, he is also producing object drawings, right? Mm -hmm. He talks about it as a battle, mm -hmm. really. He would have the pure drawings hanging in the house in Woodstock, and then he would go into the studio and do these charcoal drawings mm -hmm. of objects. Mm -hmm. And they really started with objects that were around mm -hmm. him. 
and then evolved from that mm -hmm. into, I think, what's next, the small paintings. Mm -hmm. So on the, the black and white photograph uh, is of these small paintings around 1972 or so. Mm -hmm. um, but many of them were completed in 68. They became, the, these have been referred by some as Philip Guston's alphabet. Mm -hmm because these forms that he developed in, on, on a small scale um, eventually coalesced into uh, l much larger images. And I included the slide on the right um, as it pertains to the Met gift. Almost all of these small paintings are a part of that. And together with the studio, which you've already seen, this wonderful installation shot um, from the Houston version of the current retrospective mm -hmm. shows one third of the paintings mm -hmm. in the gift. Mm -hmm. So uh, contrary to what some have implied, it's, it's a large gift, it's an important gift, mm -hmm. but it's not an overwhelming gift because so many of the works are modest in size. Yes, including the drawings. Including well. the drawings, mm -hmm. that's right. Mm -hmm. So this was a real turning point. He had produced an enormous amount of work um, by this time, and this is almost into 1970 in the photograph. The photograph was taken by Frank Lloyd of Marlborough Gallery, who uh, David McKee brought up to Woodstock, and they decided to do an exhibition. Mm -hmm. This exhibition was a um, very, very controversial because bear in mind the last time they'd seen Philip Guston was at the Jewish Museum, these dark abstract paintings. Um, and all of a sudden they were confronted with, I think that's the next slide maybe. Mm -hmm. Oh no, we're still, we're still kind of rolling through oh. the, um, Okay. Through the yeah, well, we'll we'll return to the 1970 exhibition. Okay. And, yeah, um, but but there is, I mean, um, but there were many historical reasons why Guston began to represent hooded figures. Um, this is 1969. Mm -hmm. um, the Klan was terrorizing the country, terrorizing African Americans. And um, we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about his engagement with this particular figure, which was longstanding and related very much to his early work and to his um, life as a young Jewish man growing up in Los Angeles. So, um after, after the show at the Marlboro Gallery, he went to um, Italy, and when he returned, when they returned, um, he took up his friendship with a much younger writer, Philip Roth, who had just completed a, uh, a book called Our Gang, which was a satirical treatment of the first Nixon administration. And it inspired my father to do this wild series mm -hmm. of almost 200 satirical drawings. This is one of the more polite <laughs> yes. of those satirical drawings. So, <laughs> I think there are four in the gift, mm -hmm. um, as I recall. And among them were uh, a whole series that he had made almost into a book that was never published in his lifetime um, called Poor Richard, and it was sort of a life of Richard Nixon. They were born in the same year, 1913, very close to one another in Southern California. And I guess there was some, my father was fascinated with the concept of evil, like what, what makes an ambitious man, my father being an ambitious mm -hmm. man, obviously, um, turn, to the dark side mm -hmm. and become really evil. He was fascinated with that. And so if you're interested in this, in this uh, sequence of drawings, it is now on display at the National Gallery in Washington mm -hmm. as an adjunct show uh, with the retrospective there. Mm -hmm. So we're going to run through some That's photographs good. of really fantastic 
um, paintings from the 1970s, which are part of the promise gift. And you could write a novel on each one of these, um, each one of these works. The flame. Um, these wonderful late acrylic on these are the last board. works my father mm -hmm. made before his death and the uh, black and white photograph there of these small works um, which were done after a heart attack had made it impossible for him to stand and do large-scale works mm -hmm. um, we found these in the studio after he died And, and in this slide, we've decided to juxtapose um, a work from 1930, you see it at the bottom, bottom left, with a work from 1980, one of the last drawings that he made. Mm -hmm. and, and here the past meets the present. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So this, the study, the early study, is also from a Montaigne mm -hmm. painting. And um, you can see that the other drawing is a take on that. Mm -hmm. I doubt that he pulled it out, the old drawing out and looked mm -hmm. at it, but he, he always talked about his themes and his experiences with work as being circular. Mm -hmm. He always thought about circling back. Mm -hmm. I think these late works are among the most powerful. They're so poignant and they confront issues around mortality, precarity, vulnerability. And, and there's a humor in some of them as oh, well. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we wanted to um, just introduce, we're running out of time, so we might go a little bit longer, Kate and Lulu, <laughs> maybe five extra minutes um, of your time. So it's 1970, we're in 1970, and your father opens a solo exhibition at Marlboro Gallery it's his first solo show since 1966, I think. And so the New York art world had not seen his paintings for, for some time. And this show really turned heads. It wasn't the first time he turned heads, and it wouldn't be the last, but it was explosive, this, this exhibition. And I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about what happened and how this event and the debate around this exhibition um, both prefigures the postponement of the retrospective, yeah. the current traveling retrospective in 2020, and also how it differed from it. Well, um, the work that was shown at the Marlboro Gallery, um, and you notice they didn't put the clan-like figures on the cover of the catalog. So that's maybe the least controversial of the work that was shown there, uh, was completely rejected by the art world, almost completely. There were a couple of critics who understood, I think, what my father was trying to do. But by and large, I would say the reaction, I always quote the title of the New York Times uh, review by Hilton Kramer which was entitled, A Mandarin Pretending to be a Stumble Bum. Mm -hmm. So that gives you a flavor of how hated this work. Mm -hmm. This was not, this was an era when critics had strong control over the direction that artists, mm -hmm. were, abstract art was supposed to go. Mm -hmm. And um, he went a completely different and unexpected mm -hmm. way. It, but it was a way that had everything to do with his childhood mm -hmm. and boyhood growing up mm -hmm. in Los Angeles and his experiences that he somehow needed to bring up and mm -hmm. explore again. One of his, one of the murals that he created in Los Angeles was actually destroyed um, by Klan's members who were part of the LAPD. Um, and so his, um, um, that that traumatic experience stayed with him and was amplified every time the Klan, you know, um, um, uh, uh, reasserted itself over the lives of um, both African Americans and and Jewish people. And we've talked a little bit about this, but um, the the you said that the reason the exhibition in 1970 was rejected had more to do with his having turned his back on, on abstraction. And actually very few critics mentioned the presence of 
hooded figures, clansmen in the paintings, and those figures dominated um, that work. Um, and in 2020, the traveling exhibition was postponed. Um, uh, and in that case, it was mostly because of those um, those paintings. And so, and we've talked a lot about ab about that postponement. And um, maybe you could just well, this was uh, in the wake of the George Floyd murder and all the um, outrage that followed that. The feeling was, and it was also a time of great turmoil in the museum world, yes, yes. where museums were under attack for their lack of diversity, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for not exhibiting the work of, of um, black uh, artists and people of color mm -hmm. and women. And it, it was just a very turbulent time. Yes. And it was felt by the four museum directors who were going to exhibit the show that um, the public might entirely misunderstand mm -hmm. the nature of this work, mm -hmm. um, which was uh, obvious, I say obviously anti-racist, but I've been told actually that many people take mm -hmm. exception to that because it's not obvious to them what it is. It's a very complicated work. Yes. Um, I included this incredible photograph from, uh, from the Southern po Poverty Law Center Klan Watch report because these are the jalopies with the Klan members mm -hmm. that my father depicts mm -hmm. in his work riding around the painting depicted here is part mm -hmm. of the gift. Yes. Um, so it was felt that the museums needed to do a lot more work um, to contextualize the show. And I think so far that seems to have mm -hmm. been successful. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can't really say much more than yes. that. And, and the exhibition is currently at the National Gallery of, uh, of Art in Washington, D.C. This version, or venue, was curated by Harry Cooper, and it's incredible. I encourage everyone to see it who hasn't seen it yet. And it's going to be on view until the end of August, mm -hmm. so it's there for a good long mm -hmm. time. And then it goes to London. So I want to bring us back to you. I want us to end with you. And um, because you have lived an extraordinary life, um, and the stewarding of your father's career has actually been just a small part of what you've accomplished over the years. And so I um, would like to end um, with a discussion of your advocacy for breast cancer patients and also your philanthropy. Okay, so my second book was also a memoir uh, called Examining Myself. I was diagnosed uh, with breast cancer about nine months after I published Night Studio. And um, I became very involved with the online community of breast cancer and I started reaching out to other women who were, and men who were newly diagnosed and their families and eventually realized that there was one important group of patients who were being completely unheard and, un -neglect and neglected in terms of advocacy, and that's uh, people living with metastatic breast cancer and their families, the advanced form of the disease. And so I took it upon myself to, to uh, direct my advocacy toward them. I wrote a book, uh, Advanced Breast Cancer, that involved interviewing 35 uh, patients and spouses and just bringing their experiences. I realized that I didn't know enough of the medicine and science at that point for to start responding to the people who were coming to me mm -hmm. with questions. And so I immersed myself in science training for advocates. Um, I surveyed, Silent Voices was the product of a survey that I did of about 600 mm. breast cancer patients, one, several, one of several that I did. I ended up 
writing and publishing with an epidemiologist from Johns Hopkins, mm -hmm. an online web course that thousands of patients, mm -hmm. advocates, and medical people have taken. It's still online. Um, and eventually, I stepped back from my advocacy work around 2015, around the time that the McKees retired and closed their gallery. I realized that there was a real need. And around that time, we had started the, the um, Gustin Foundation. And it was clear that there was a real need to, to advance the legacy work. So I've, I was convinced. Uh, by that time that there would be others that would carry on this neglected work, which was neglected no more. And so after about 25 years, I retired as an advocate. Mm -hmm. And so for the last eight years, this is what I've been doing. Mm -hmm. Well, I, um, I want to end with this wonderful picture of the three, three muses. Three muses. Three muses. That's my... Mm -hmm grandmother, my mother's mother, and my mother and me, um, all named Musa Jane, mm -hmm. Musa Jane. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was a wonderful way to end our conversation um, because this photograph places you in um, a very distinguished matrilineage of great women doing great things, um, much like Lulu Wong, our, our sponsor and <laughs> um, and and protector, I Musa, thank you so much for this conversation. It's been wonderful. Thank you all for joining. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Musa and Kelly. Oh, that was fascinating, and it was truly heartfelt. And Thank you for taking us on a journey, uh, not only through heart, art, but through the women like Musa, who have deeply impacted art, and, and themselves are so shaped by the art in their lives. We will be joined by Musa and Kelly for the reception in the Temple of Dendur. So I'm sure many of you want to, may have a question, but I think we all would love to give Musa and Kelly a hug. So we will have the, uh, the cocktails in the Temple of Dendur. But um, before I leave, I just want to take a few minutes here to, to really thank Kelly, not only for this superb conversation today, but also for her inestimable uh, contributions to the Met during her eight years here. On May 1st, sadly, Kelly will assume the role of John and Mary Papa John Director of the Des Moines Art Center in Iowa. We are so sorry to see Kelly leave us, but. We do know uh, she's brilliant and she has an incredible career ahead of us and uh, we just couldn't hold her, but we hope she will join us many times, come back for the critical eye every year and we, we wish her all the very best. Thank you.